this episode of The Silburn Show, the Solution-Oriented Summit, creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking solutions and impacting actions, tackling knife and gun crime in our community. Let it not be our legacy. I don't even know where to start. One of the things I did commit to doing a couple of months ago is to stop going to meetings. Um, I did promise Silver I'd attend this meeting because I believe in Silver. Me and Silver do lots of different things together. We understand where we're coming from. I understand what Silver wants. But the reason I said I basically stopped going to meetings is because I, in the last two months, I went to 16 different meetings. Mm. And of those 16 different meetings, not one solution. And that's what really, really worried me because it made me realize that talk is not going to change anything. Mm. What's going to change anything in our communities, and this is kind of why I think me and Silver will connect because he knows I'm the kind of guy that will go out there and I will find the awareness that you need mm. to open that topic. And so for me, everything that I do is about accountability. Mm. It's about me securing that small space in my, in my community and making the changes that will mirror itself within the community. I'm so fed up of people saying that we need to form groups. You know, each one of you here is a representative of your community. Each one of you here will be judged by your works. Yes. Each one of you here, and I said it as simple as this to somebody the other day, it's like seeing somebody drop something. We're going to Amsterdam for my wedding anniversary. I was reading up in Amsterdam. It's like, if you drop a piece of paper before you pick it up. If somebody drops a part of the community, you have to pick it up. Mm. You have to start this mentality. We cannot wait until these figures start increasing. And so <clears throat> there's a few topics I really want to touch on before I pass on the mic because one of the things is people should never let me speak. Because when they let me speak, I don't hold back. I'm going to tell it as it is. Yeah? Many people see me on the bill and they go, oh, we don't turn up there because it's going to hurt. Yeah, the truth is going to hurt. The number one truth with what's going on now is that we are not accountable enough. Does that make sense? We are not accountable as, I'm not even gonna go and say the black community, <clears throat> I'm gonna say that word, just community. Because be, before we can be accountable for our communities, we gotta understand that our community is made up of loads of different people. We gotta understand that it's not only black boys, and you heard the list, it's not only black children being stabbed to death. It's not only, well, marginally more black children being charged for murder, but not only black children being stabbed to death on our street. So we have to be those people that identify that, you know, children are children. You know, and I found out actually, and maybe somebody can correct me on this, that that list of 75 or 80 children, people that have been killed in London, that have been apportioned to black boys doing it, because the media is very, very good at that. It makes you believe that these are all down to gangs, these are some of the names on that list, and I read through that list, have, have, have nothing to do with gangs whatsoever. But what's happening now is everything's being grouped in. So every time you hear a stabbing, <clears throat> a killing, you instantly think, gang, black boy, look at them, we need to save them, we need to do so many different things. What a lot of these black boys and I've formed an organization dealing with black boys because you know, we need to start speaking about them again in the positive because our children are not monsters. My children are not monsters. My children may display certain behaviors, but one of the principles that I live by is that the human being is never the behavior. You have to detach the two. And when you detach the two, you start understanding where these young people are coming from. So, Mr. McKenzie, I carry a knife because I'm the baddest man in top of this scared. What are you scared of? The community. So young people are scared of their own community. Young, you know, my son used to go to, this is only going about three months. He wanted to start going to, he's in year six, he's going into year seven. He wanted to start going to the shop on his own. The shop is literally 200 meters away. So I send him there. Obviously me as a parent, I'm now fearful thinking, is he gonna be safe? So I send him to the shop, he's excited, he goes to the shop, comes back, goes to the shop. We do this for a few days, and then one day he comes and says, I, I, I don't want to go to the shop no more. Because there's a group of boys who hang around the shop. And I'm thinking to myself, when did society become that your children are fearful? We've got children, 
young adults, 16, 17, 18 year old boys, insisting to their parents that they take minicabs to school. And their parents are accommodating the minicab to school. So think for well, fast forward five years now, that person becomes a young adult contributing to his community, full of fear. Full of no, he's got no confidence in his community. What happens to that community? So for me, a lot of the work I do is understanding that <clears throat> what we are in now is a trend. And I've spoken to so many organizations about this, and I'm telling these organizations, we are dealing with a trend at the moment. This cannot continue. It's a trend. And they're saying to me, oh, what are you talking about? It's going to go. I said, how can this continue? What happens in any single trend, any human behavior trend, is it does this. And when it reaches saturation point, we think the world is over, right? And then it goes on a decline. Now, for me, the importance of the work I'm doing now is dealing with preparing for when there's a decline. Because I'm going to tell you this, this is what you need to start thinking about as organizations. You need to start thinking about a group of 20 boys who have witnessed somebody being cut to pieces. Who's dealing with their trauma? Are these the same group of 20 boys who have not stabbed, but they've been, they've been privy to seeing this? Who's going to be dealing with those mental health issues? So now we're talking about a generation which possibly you're going to see a spike in mental health issues. Who's dealing with the young girls? I was talking to a young uh, a mother the other day. Her, her daughter, 13 years old, has been passed around five gangs. Who's going to pick up the pieces that's, a, that's potentially a young mother, right? Who's going to pick up the pieces and correct that behavior there? So, for me, I believe that this is why the solution evades us. Because we're looking for a solution that's going to go, stop, put the knife down, done. It's never going to happen. If you're offering a young person, you know, for him, you, I'm telling you to make a choice, put the knife down. What are you going to offer me when I put it down? Because right now, it makes me feel safe. Do you understand where I'm going from? Right now, this is what protects me when I leave the house to go to school. You go to work, this is what makes sure I get home. So now you want me to drop this. How, what are you going to offer me? This is actually a question I'm asking you now. What, what are you going to offer that young man? Yeah, I think, I think um, to offer that young man support in some way, or just someone, some, it's a case of making sure that they're able to speak, but first of all, to an older person, that's who they're looking to. But my, my thing is this, is, as I've grown up, I've realised that we don't have a community. We have a bunch of people living together, but a community is all about union. We don't have any union. So in that case, for me, it's, it's, it's come down to my own individual behaviours and not looking for a leader or a group, because I'm my own group, I'm a leader of one. That's, that's what I live by anyway. Um, because when I've reached out, I've been disappointed because not everyone's on the same wavelength. So the children that I speak to, all I can do is just offer my support in terms of come to me if you need to speak about anything. When I was growing up, my parents were working. Everyone's working, this and that and the other. So, if I had to go and speak to my dad about anything, first of all, as a young child, I'd look at him. Look at his face, look at his body language, and then say, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to tomorrow. So we're all under pressure. So, I'm not, of the, I'm not the type of guy to to, to put anyone down because I understand that the, the actual pressure that people are under is actually trauma. And as you mentioned, no one's picked up the pieces for the adults. Um, so we can do our best with the children, but me personally, I think it's 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 down to the adults. So I won't be able to help that 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 boy if I've got bare problems myself. I can't do it. You're actually right on the money. You know, we received, we sat in the car yesterday, nothing that comes out of my life. I, my life is amazing, because I commit. So I'm able to speak to people, to come up 
solution. We sat in the quiet today, and, and a prominent youth worker in this community called us up to say that because um, we did some work around him and what was going on in his, in his early life, and it turned out that he'd been very, very brutally abused as a child. That's why he does work now. But he actually came to the realization that in order for him to make an effect, he has to deal with that first. So you're actually quite right. In a broken community, you cannot have solidarity. It can't, it can't exist. Because unless we're willing to sit in a room and show our vulnerabilities, and show that there's a group of men crying for our young people. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? The other day there was a, when we had that last fight and then we had groups of people going out into the streets with megaphones. Uh, and, I, and I like making these comments because I like creating pain. And my comment was, before you, before you go on march for somebody else's child, learn to walk with your own. So Paul, um, are we, so we're talking about broken community today. The same we're talking about communities that have been deliberately torn yes. apart. Let's see what the shepherds. Um, <coughs> so I'm going back to your original question about what we offer young people. As an alternative, I think um, the big part of that is being providing your open space in the first place. So going back to where you talk about the body line, you talk to a parent. Um, we need to provide spaces where we can be honest with each other and so add on to that. And also, um, what you're saying about broken people trying to fix other people, or um, as a, as a, another meaning that day. And, um, one of the gentlemen on the panel said um, they have people telling young people to follow their dreams, but you haven't got to follow, follow your own. It's, it's that sort of, you know, sort of house out, they can sort out someone else's. But um, going back to the original point, it's, it's, it's building that resilience and providing alternatives, which I think is the main thing. And then adding on to what you're saying about meetings before, it's actually the, the follow up as well. So, um, it's, we can have really great discussions, say we, we can do this, we can do this, da 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 da. Why not say, let's reconvene in a month or two months' time and actually see what's happened. And if nothing's happened, find out the reasons why. Because I think, I think that's the main thing. So essentially, hold the people that need to be accountable. Yeah. Because what we do, and I think that deserves a round of applause, actually. Yeah. Yeah. What we do, and we're very good at it is we do attend meetings and we, we, we attend meetings because we're socially responsible and I'm looking around here and it's very, it's very void of young people as these meetings normally are mm -hmm. yeah? these meetings need to focus on the voice of young people what are they saying? I'm here for a different reason to a young person a young person might tell you that he's fed up of seeing his friends die in front of his eyes that's why he's here and that voice that you would listen to is completely different to why we're here so I guess what you're saying is, is actually right because the approach is to be non-judgmental. Because young people nowadays believe they are young bad people. And that's a belief system that has been ingrained in them by most of us. And I say most of us because most of these people that I talk to, they say, oh, you know, you can't walk on the street, these you to kill each other, lock them all up. And I think to myself, are you really listening to what you're saying? Lock them all up until you start doing work outside of London. And then you go outside of London and we go as far as Dover, I've just formed an alliance with an organization in Dover, who are dealing with young, blonde, blue-eyed children who are exhibiting the same behavior. So the trend I'm speaking about, saturation, it will leave London. Because these parents are now witnessing this for the first time. That, you know, we met with six, six women came down, six women from Dover, every one of her, their, those children were in prison. Hmm. Now there's an epidemic, or they call it an epidemic, happening outside of London. Why are we not focusing on the UK? Knife and gun crime problem. Because perhaps if we did that, we would have to start looking at different communities. Do you understand? And perhaps the problem wouldn't seem that bad for bloody. Because if you start drafting in what's happening across the country, the whole county lines thing, the whole, you know, the whole crime wave that's moving up north, you're going to get a different picture. So one of the things I don't pay attention to is the media. Because if I pay attention to the media, I wouldn't leave my house. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up, I wouldn't go out and speak to young people. I just wouldn't do it. Because I honestly believe that young people are facing, 
you know, we think they're facing problems. They, they're facing problems. They don't feel safe. When I was young, when you guys were young, you, you, my son said to me, he said, your, your, your youth sounded like it was fun. Because I was saying, you know, we used to go out on the bikes and just ride up into the, you know, like in, in the high parts of the city and look down and chill there and drink drinks and have fun. And he said, how come we can't do that now? I said, to be honest, son, and this is the honesty of it, I can't trust what's going on out there. I can't, I can't let you loose on a bike somewhere. But the question is this, is that a fact or is that an illusion? Does that make sense? So when you stop listening to the media, you have to start trusting what you see out your window. Fair enough, you do see the flowers, we all see the flowers. You know, when young people talk about it differently, they say, well look what's happening across the world. Look what's happening across the world and you're looking at us, we as human beings can't even get it right yet. And yet we want our young people to all of a sudden fix up. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. I was rambling on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I just want to say something. I think. Yes. Um, you guys said great stuff. I think we, we talked about two important things, not just the youngsters, also the adults. I don't think, I don't know if you heard that. I've always said, in order to help some of these issues, you have to help yourself first. And I think that uh, it's not just our youth agree myself have um, issues, I think also parents have uh, issues. And we need to address this properly and we have to address it now. So the part, the part of this uh, summit is not just talking. You know, we want to hear from you. We also want to make sure what we say is according to what you guys are saying. But we also want to be honest, you know I mean? It's, 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 a, it's, it's a long word. And recently I've decided to, say, to sit down with a few people who I believe we really have the same common cause in order to help the communities, not just for us, also for our kids, because I've got four children, two sets of children, by the way, just so, you know, and it's not easy. And my, my, my first set, I'm going to uh, secondary school, and they're beautiful young girls. I'm, I'm not concerned, but I'm like, why? What's, what's going to happen? You know what I mean? But I'm also preparing them to, to, to know that this world is not a fantasy. So I want to come back to what you said earlier. Yeah, it's, it's true, it's right, and we have to act, we have to acknowledge it. And many of us, I would say, most of us are black people, I don't know, it's, it's everyone, but most of us are black people, we tend to refuse to acknowledge we've got mental problems, mental issues, I would say. Because if you can't see what is wrong with you, you can't see friends. Right? You can't go to a doctor, and today we have doctors right now, they go by textbooks. They don't really have the time to spend with you, to talk to you, to watch home you are kind of things. And I think it's important for every single one of us now and to also find a place where we can open. I think the church, that's where the church is there for, isn't it? And I think that is what pastor is there for. But in the game, we have to talk about it. Yes, the church is not really helping, as everybody know. And I'm, I'm a big vocal person talking about this. I think that the church has failed the community big time. Uh, I, was, I was speaking to Stephen uh, a couple of days ago. What are you going to do? Not just the community, but also the churches. And coming here, seeing my dad, because it's easy I'm the youngest, but they all love to be my daddies. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'm seeing I'm seeing I'm what. I'm seeing what. <laughs> are we to, to come today? to think of a stepping stone, right? And you guys are coming, not just to listen, but to also contribute to what we're going to do. Because this is going to be very really complex, you guys. I spoke to Silver, I spoke to Paul, because me and Paul are Silver, and it's all people who are going to work together, we're going to merge our efforts. Because it's all about coming together. And I've said to them, be prepared, we're going to have disagreement in our But the most important thing is, is to go forward. Well, there will be challenges, but you know, we're gonna get there. And I'm seeing success. I got people from from um, from different part of London. And I think Paul is gonna finish me and you have a relationship, so <laughs> see yeah, I, I think I think I think it's time for us. It's time for us to to to, to, to take a step. And I would like you uh, to actually I like what you just said. There are people out there that want to work. 
You get this, there's not someone coming to us that says you want to help out in terms of major issues. And if you want to reach out, Paul is the first person. And I'm always going to show you how to get to that sometime. And yes, what he said earlier, I think parenting is something you have to look up. So yeah, that's what we're here for. Any questions? First of all. So, so <clears throat> essentially going back to, let me take a question. Um, what my question is, I know you said this when you came in earlier, that we've been to a lot of meetings like this where there's been talks, and then as I sat there, uh, I can hear us talking again. And I was like, is there a way we can put down points and say this is what we want to do? And this is the way we're going. I'll tell you why I'm asked that question. Um, I was privileged to be invited to Leadership Council a meeting some few years ago. I think it was last year. And we were talking about the same issue. And a young man got up. He's a white man. He got up. I think he's 16. And this is what he said. He said, when I have issues with suicidal tendency, they said there weren't enough counsellors to counsel me. So I had to be on a waiting list for a long time. And in my mind, what I've been asking myself is this. Is there a way that we can set up strategic places where a lot of these young people, when they need help, they can go there? The second thing I want to say is this. Is there a way that we can help parents to mentor parents. We do a lot of parenting courses here because I'm so much into parents. Because you guys can talk. My son is 24. I turned 61 this year. My son is 24 and I have a daughter who's 26. And I know what I went through. Okay? And what I did was the parenting. And this is one question that I want to ask. A young man, girl said to his father, how much did they pay you per hour? He says, $100. And he says to his dad, can you loan me $50? And his dad says, no. Later on, his dad went to his room and gave him $50. And he came back and said, dad, can I just buy one hour of your time? I mean, what we miss is that children don't spell love, L-O-V-E. They spell love, T-I-M-E. And that's what's missing. And if we can mentor, not just children, but mentor parents, we probably will have a headway. That's what I wanted to add. is that there is a shared responsibility. You know, it's a parent and child thing. And before I move on, there is just one word. Uh, you said it, and I'm going to pick it up. But we had this meeting about this, because we meet all the time. This is what I like about it. It's very proactive. We meet, we come up with you know, internal solutions, which we're going to roll out. Um, it's the word kid. Now, that's one word I've deleted. And that's the one word that I find detaches um, that, that emotion from a child is the kid. Because what is a kid? <laughs> and, and we're surprised when it acts like baby goats. <laughs> so, so the first thing in the organization that we formed is that word we don't use. Is the, 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 the mothers came down from Dover. That's the word that came out of all them. My kids, my kids, my kids. I said, listen, I'm going to show you something very, 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 very easily. Stop saying that word now and say child. Do you feel a different attachment to that? Hmm. Instantly. So what we're doing is here, we're fighting for our children. And we're going to take our children back. I'm going to make two more points and I'm going to hand over the mic. Um, one point is, is I remember a while ago, I remember uh, going to a meeting and it was the Asian community and there were issues in the Asian community and they ended the meeting by saying, this stops here. Hmm. And do you know what stopped there? the issue. They're that responsible. Everybody that turned up to that meeting knew they had a remit to leave to do. There wasn't a remit to organize or go on Facebook to find another meeting. <laughs> Nobody here should be at the next meeting yeah. unless it's this meeting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because you come back with your feedback. Yes. You don't go to another meeting and start 400 years ago quantifying the fact that we are black people. We know that. Mm -hmm. Of those 16 meetings I went to, 
fifth dealer than what started, literally started 400 years ago. So we spent an hour and a half, two hours, talking about slavery. Does that make sense where we go wrong? We know where we are. We know we are upstanding members of our own communities. Own it. Why do we have to go and start over here? And this is what the issue is. is nobody wants to start at the next step. And I'll explain why this happens. There's two strategies that people use. There's one called away from and one called towards. We have been trained to use the away from strategy, which is why we keep going back to make sure we never go back. Does that make sense? We have to be brave enough to go forward. Everything that comes out of our mouths needs to be about forward. Am I making sense? Yeah. yeah? The next thing I want to talk about very briefly, because it's a quick lesson, because I don't know if Silwan told you that, he's only hired me for an hour. Um, <laughs> I'm doing a kid's birthday party. Uh, I did say <laughs> 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 You know why I said that? Oh, that's a good <laughs> thing. It did work. Stand accountable. But you know why I said that? Because the prior just popped up in my head, and that was the one word across it. Kid's party. Anytime you hear that, yeah. you know where the worst place is in schools? Yeah. These kids, these kids, no. Schools don't even call them children no more. That's what, what, we can go on about that for ages. You didn't point me out. That's excellent. Top marks. But what I really want to talk about is, is, is behavior. Because I think that I'm not going to leave here today without offering a solution or an understanding to an issue that we are a little bit miffed about. And it's called values. It's called values. You have them in your houses. We've got children, put your hands up. Yeah. Who's got kids? Put your hands up. Please <laughs> 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 leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <I'm> the text. <laughs> Look, she's there. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about children and children's behavior and when a child's behavior starts becoming an issue. Okay? From the ages of zero to seven, at every school I've been to, I always start with the value system. The schools are really good. They go, these are the values of the school, and none of us teachers live by these values, but we want to enforce them onto your children. And we wonder why your children won't take any notice of them, because every Friday night I go out and I get drunk. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nobody lives by the values, but they want your children. And when your children don't live by the values, they become an issue. Right? So values and behavior. So between the ages of zero to seven, your child is in the imprint stage of his life. Your child follows the values that you give your child. When you come in and you say, see that alleyway there? Bad things. Your child listens to you. You see that food there? Good for you. Your child listens to you. Go to bed at 7.30. You need sleep to go to school the next day. Your child listens to you. What we're finding is, is that Children who enter year four, check with any primary school, year four is the most difficult year. They always say this, what's in year four? They were showing signs. This is what happens. Between the ages of eight to 13, your child starts checking that your values are correct. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, and our child did it, he comes home, and he's up until the age of, you know, up to year four, he's sat on the bed, seven, five, bedtime, night, that, mm -hmm. sleep. All of a sudden I go in bedtime. <laughs> so I walk up and I come back. I said bedtime. All of a sudden. <laughs> so immediately as a parent, I'm saying to myself, what the hell is going on here? Why are we now in a conflict frame? Does that make sense? Why are we at because from the ages of eight to thirteen, they enter into a stage where they I'm just checking your values. But well, who are they checking them with? So, this is what we do with, with, with our son, because I know and I prepare for these things. So I start looking at who's in his class. And then I start understanding the children in this class that have no bedtime in <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So during this imprint, you know, the imprint stage, everything was cool, bedtime, seven for eight, everything was nice. My, my rules on my house mm. meant everything. 
A lot of parents are dealing with that change in value. And they're not preparing for that change in value. So, if you've got a child and they're going into year four and they're now at the age of eight, you start noticing that they start acting like their friend. And they start giving you the lip. And all they're doing is, it's not a conflict. It's like when my dad used to say to me, um, you can't do something. I would always sit there and go, why? And that led me to ending up in prison. Because everything he told me, I challenged. And I challenged it because, I don't know, dad, I've never been in prison. So why are you telling me not to do everything because I'm going to end up in prison? Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden, I'm in prison because I challenged his, his beliefs and his values and ended up listening to somebody else who was grooming me. And this is where the whole area of peer grooming is so important. We're not talking about peer grooming enough. We're talking about why these young people are killing. Let's talk about why they're being groomed. Let's talk about some of these victims are victims because they didn't follow through with the grooming. These are the things we don't want to, we don't want to talk about. So peer grooming, for example, between the ages of um, 8, 30, all the way up to early teens, because there is a stage where you start reverting back. And I had this argument with somebody who, who I'm a 2-1 at uni, I should know. And I said, don't you find that when people, adults, get to about 21, and, and especially when they have their first child, don't you notice they go all the way back to zero to seven? Now all of a sudden they go back to their parents' values, right? So between the ages of eight and, and say 21, they kind of lost out, they're challenging the world's values. So this is what we have to prepare for. Who are their influences? Who are they getting their belief systems from? You have, you have not failed your child. Too many parents believe that they failed their child. All you need to do to prepare for when they're becoming slightly inquisitive. So now I'm having this hour-long conversation with my son who's telling me 10.30 is his bedtime. And I'm saying to myself, there's two things I could do here. I could bust his ass, or I could try and think about where is he coming from? Where is he coming from? Because unless I start to understand where he's coming from, he's going to challenge it more and more. And then I'm going to become the guy in the house that is, oh, I hate my dad, I hate my dad. So the job as a parent is to understand, because everything is communication. Young people will effectively put their arms down if the right communication is used. Does that make sense? We can't keep saying, you, 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 drop the knife. You've got to say, first of all, we've got to ask the whys. No one's asking the whys. Nobody's prepared to support them in, this, in them feeling safe. So we as a community have to become those people that rebuild, essentially, a community. So when I walk down the street and I'm a young man and I see you two holding hands, I know you two and I know I see you holding hands all the time, that's the most beautiful thing ever. It shows that there's a man, there's a woman. Right now a lot of these young boys don't have a father figure. Let's become the father figures to these boys. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and I'm such a shame, I'm just going to end with this. A year and a half ago I put a post up and I said I'm calling 100 men to spend one hour a week in your community with one boy, four responses. And so that showed me where we are and what we need to change. Okay, I think that's that. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, thank you. I was trying to get in before you did the final word. So the final word is done. Uh, solution oriented summit is crucial because, uh, as you gentlemen mentioned earlier, it doesn't make sense we come here and have a talk show. And uh, someone put on Facebook, um, and they put up this, this program and they said, ladies and gentlemen, go to this event to make sure it is not another talk show. Yeah? And uh, I want to ask you this question. Out of what you've said and the work you're doing, what would you say are some of the three solutions or uh, remedies that you believe that can help the community and the crime issue? Based on your perspective, key three solutions, action points. The, the key solution is this accountability. <coughs> The key solution is owning the talk. You want change, you be the change. You understand what I'm saying? I can't stand seeing marches where men march, and I said it before, for other people's children, and they've got children all over the place. And they're not even looking after their own relationship. Does that make sense? We have to repair ourselves. That's key. Because when a community is strong, guess what? No one can touch that community. Look at any other community. 
the strength in it, no one infiltrates it. There's nothing that happens in that community without the community stopping it first. That's one thing. The next thing is this, the, the whole thing about us being judgmental about our young people. We have to understand that if I feel, um, if I'm not safe in my community, the one thing I'm going to gravitate to is love. So we have to stop doing this and start doing this. And when they come over to you, you hug that. That's human, that's human behavior. The media is not going to show you this. The media is going to show you that they are demons. You never had demons. You understand what I'm saying? You never had demons. The third thing is this, and this is one of the key things, and this is the, the, the premise that we work on, is that for these organizations waiting for funding to go into their community, they need to be shut down. Because you don't need, you don't need funding to walk out there now and hug somebody or talk to a young person, do you? But there's too many organizations waiting for the point where they turn on, for them to print their t-shirts, and I said it's going to hurt, in order for them to act like they're going out and changing lives. We started an organization that is in a, a location that nobody goes to, and yet we have a regular cohort of eight to ten boys that come here. And they come from as far as Dagenham. So nobody can tell me that young people don't want to change. Young people want to change, they just want to see the support system. Yes. Yes, thank you. And does anyone have any questions they want to ask Paul? about the fact that you wouldn't let your son go out on his bike and go up to a high point in London. And it just made me think about something that it's kind of like now a vicious cycle. You've said that you can't trust what's going on out there, so you're scared, so you told your son why things are different to how you were. So he will then take that on, making him scared, not necessarily thinking just your son, obviously, I'm just yeah, using yeah, this as an example. Um, so he's scared, and then you end up with scared children who can't trust anything or anybody around them. And what do they want? They want to protect themselves. And so they'll do that in whichever way they feel is appropriate, including carrying weapons. And so I think that although this is just a kind of off-the-cuff example, but that in and of itself makes the world so much smaller for that child, um, and that that, in and of itself, is a self perpetuated cycle that we have to break. I'll give you a round of applause. The thing with my son, and, and, and dealing with that fear, is to teach him that it's false evidence of being good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist, and so what we're doing now, is, because he's going into secondary school in September, what we're doing now is dealing with his transition. There's a lot of, a lot of young boys and we had this debate and uh, some of you put their hand up in a meeting on Wednesday and said, yeah, you know, summer is the best time for young people. I said, actually it's not. Because a, a lot of young people during the summer are actually at that stage where I was talking about. They're terrified now of going into secondary school because they're now the youngest again. So for my son, is giving him confidence, that's the key. Because your children have to have confidence, yeah? To know that this thing is somewhat of an illusion that will pass. Now I keep saying to them, this thing, this fear that you've got will pass because it cannot sustain itself. We could not have a society or a generation of young people that are going before us. That means essentially we're gone. Because when we're gone, who's going who's to replace us? We are gone. So we have to be accountable now, not tomorrow, and we have to be the ones that rebuild that confidence in our young people to go outside and say, you know what, I'm going to drag this old bike. And I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to fix the bike, that's what we used to do. I'm going to fix the bike up, and then I'm going to go and ride the head out of the bike. There's nothing wrong with that, that's normal. But what we are looking at and calling normal now is killing on the streets. That is abnormal. So we have to first, as adults, divide the two. We want things to become normal. Things at the moment are completely abnormal. Never buy into that. 
the media will tell you that things out there are normal, every day a child dies. No, no it's not. Statistically that's what you want us to believe, but I'm not having it, I'm not buying that. I'm, be I'm believing in the fact that the community is repairing itself, and one day when this trend ends, young people will look back and go, wow, that's what a community looks like. Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, I noticed that we were talking about like, you know, young people is not rude. I've got a daughter, I've got friends who've got kids and they're not rude. They're brilliant kids, they're doing excellent out there. And you have children who, you know, what are we doing for, in terms of drugs? You know, these children are having drugs available so freely that is causing mental issues at a very young age. Um, that is the killer. I think that is the killer that is causing that main issues around us. We are failing to address the problem. A lot of adults is, is, is on drugs themselves. So their kids are just hooking on to it. I think I may have the answer. You know, so what are we doing to alleviate that problem? The you know the main issue of drugs because there's all different substances. Yeah, substances. So, so, yeah. Substances. Twelve years ago, I was at the Harry. I used to manage the Harry Day Drug Education Team. Perfect job, which meant I went into schools, primary schools and secondary schools, with a case of drugs that it looked like drugs. Yeah and filled with folders and folders of workshops for young people to make them aware about the long-term and short-term effects of drugs. Completely different environment. The government pulled the program on that and it's so sad because some of the young pupils that I, have seen, I saw in year six are now the ones I'm driving past seeing with a spliff in their hand. So when you start talking about who's responsible for this and where we need to change, maybe it is time we start looking at the government. Maybe we need to ask why our children are more privy to sex education than drug education. Right? You, you understand, when our children look out the window, come out of school, they see cigarette butts, alcohol, tins, um, ends of spliff, and why don't they know about these things? Why has the drug education team been replaced with wow days? Why is it your children brings a letter home now saying, we're going to a nonsense museum? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's free, it's funded by the government, but yet your child knows very little about the one thing that's going to entrap them in their own community. Yeah? So I'm hoping that answers your question. Twelve years ago, I was the, I was the manager doing this. Yeah, what, what, my question is, what are we doing? That is, was the major problem. Well, there's very little you can do now. Now, what are we trying to sort of push to actually get that rolling? Yeah, I, I, I would say, I would say, instead of, instead of, um, I might get shot for saying, I might, I might get, instead of uh, focusing on allowing, our, you know, allowing schools to allow our children to continue having Black History Month, tell them that this is not important. We need a drug. The same way we rallied that, our children need to know about peer grooming. They need to know about the drugs available in their neighborhoods. They need to know how to avoid the pitfalls. Everything in life is a pitfall. If, that, if the knowledge of that pitfall is taken away from you, guess what? You're going to fall into it. And once you fall into it for these young people, it's too late to come out. They don't even tell you once they've fallen into it, they're not even going to tell you as a parent. They're going to try and work it out themselves, and that's where the problems come from. Okay, good. We'll wrap up now. I'm going to the next time with you all. But just a quick question. Yeah, um, I, this is a general question for Sam. But um, what do you guys think about? We actually want to go to the first. Okay, uh, okay, that's fine. Um, Saturday school supplementary education, uh, providing a space where if we're not being catered to in the generic school environment. Why can't we pick up the pieces and provide our own space? Now I'm 21, but looking back when I was going through in secondary school. Um, some of my Eastern European Albanian friends at Saturday Albanian school, my Muslims friends at Muslim school. If some people are Christian, they have done Sunday school. It's, it's providing a space where if I'm not being catered to them, why not produce it myself? Going back to what you said earlier, if there's a change you want to make, be the change you want to be. Now I've started to look into this. A lot of these Saturday schools have closed recently. Now I've heard of one in Croydon, 
but I'm not sure what others are going for. Kind of, that's the sort of thing I want to really engage with. And what you say saying earlier about drugs, when I was growing up, I was never that inclined, but going back to this whole value based system, that was still with me. But there were people who could have done really well because they had issues. They went to drugs to kind of deal with those issues and they fell apart. But then there were people who had a really sorted out life and used other drugs to kind of have a good time and stuff, and they're still fine. So it's. I mean, I'm not advocating drugs that, 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 but I'm, 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 I'm just saying that so, um, depending on how they educate and the values they're putting in and the support that's there. Every, everything is not, education. Yeah. So. Because what we found in the drug program is the more you the more you inform somebody, it enables them to make a better choice. So the more you tell me that cannabis can lead to mental health issues, the more when that person comes and tries to offer it to me, I'm going to say not for me. Yeah? But if you don't know about it, uh, and the amount of young people that are using cannabis at the moment, that's what really worries me. Because that shows you the lack of education around drugs. And that's, you know, we, we spoke about the gateway drugs. You said tobacco and alcohol. Those are gateway drugs. Those are the ones that the, 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 the system already feeds you. But those are gateway drugs. You know, they use those to, you understand, to supplement the cannabis use. And the cannabis use at the moment is off the scale. Young people think that is the thing to do. Remember I told you that? But five or six years from now, you start seeing the cracks in the community, you start seeing those same young people with all the mental health issues, and that's where the problem's going to be. We think we've got a problem now. We're not accountable for this very minute. Five or six years' time, we're going to be sat here again saying, how can it have got to this level? And ladies and gentlemen, I've got a note. One of the key things which I kept emphasizing is that, uh, and I say to many people, that you cannot expect the solution to be here now and to be solved today. And the reason why it is continuing from today with this sort of um, not an organization which is being formed, but just like minded persons come together to create a platform. And, uh, and I've got an announcement to make at the end of this meeting to where we're going to be able to engage nearly 20,000 people, which will be invited to, but I'll let you know that after. One of applause for the support of Kim today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Silburn Show. And uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos, share the videos, and subscribe to the channel. Let people know about it. But important thing is also to comment. Let us get your comment. Let us get your views so we can understand how to even please you better, ladies and gentlemen. So as I said, share, like, subscribe. Ah, thank you. I saw you there. You subscribe and you shared. Thank you so much. See you next time.